Hi everybody, very welcome to Mentor and yet another video podcast. As always, I hope you're doing absolutely fantastic. Today on the video, guys, are you under a bigger risk of being infected with things like viruses, like the coronavirus, when you're out flying an aircraft? What is up with the recirculation of the air? How does the air conditioning system actually work? And also, if you stay tuned, you'll hear my story about when I was quarantined back in 2003. So stay tuned. This video has been made possible largely because of the help and support of my Patreon crew. You guys are absolutely awesome and I'm so grateful that so many people are deciding to support the channel. Now if you're sitting out there and you think, I want to support as well, well then check out this link up here. You can choose to donate as little or as much as you like, but I use my Patreon crew not only for financial support of the channel, but also to get ideas, like the idea for this video for example, or feedback on thumbnails, you get to pre-move my videos. And if you are at a $10 per month or higher, you will also become a, a premium member of the Mentor Aviation app. So, Check out the link and uh, a huge thank you to those of you who are already part of the crew. Okay guys, uh, unless you have been living under a rock for the last two weeks or so, you know that there is an absolute media frenzy regarding the novel coronavirus of 2019. This is a virus that started off uh, probably in a food market in the town of Wuhan in China. And it's spreading very quickly and very rapidly within China and it's also started to pop up all over the world uh, with death tolls starting to rise. Now, the coronavirus is a, a virus very similar to the, the common kind of flu that we tend to get every year. It's just a little bit more contagious and a little bit more deadly, at least from the initial report. Now, having said that, I really want to emphasize that the deadliness of this virus is very much in line with previous similar outbreaks. Okay, we're going to get to that later on. But the way that this virus spreads is also similar to a common um, flu virus, as in it's normally spread by bodily fluids. So if you sneeze, for example, you will spread little droplets and inside of those droplets can be the virus. Now the virus will sit in those droplets, which will be suspended in the air for a few minutes where someone could breathe it in, or they're going to fall down onto surfaces and on the surfaces they seem to be able to survive uh, and be contagious for a couple of hours. So. Um, would that mean then that since the air inside of an aircraft is being recycled that you are more likely to become infected by a virus like the coronavirus if you're flying in an aircraft? Well, in order for you to understand that you need to understand how the, um, how the air conditioning system in an aircraft works and what kind of air that you're actually breathing. So I've done a video about the air conditioning system. If you want to see more of the details about it, you can check out the link up here. But what you need to understand is that the air that you're breathing inside of the aircraft uh, is being brought in from the engine, from the, the compressor stage of the engine, the fifth and the ninth stage. It's then going through several valves into a air cycle machine. Uh, which will take away some of the liquid content, some of the fluids, like the water vapor, for example, out of it. And then it's being brought into what we call a mix manifold before the packs are sending it out. Uh, part of it, the left pack into the cockpit, and the right pack into the, uh, the passenger zones. Now, in the zones, you guys will be breathing into this air, right? And whatever you do, if you're sneezing, if you're farting, whatever you're doing, that is then being picked up and it's being sucked out and it's being recycled again. And here is where people are freaking out. They're saying, well, what if someone sneezes and it's just being recycled over and over again into the, the passenger cabin? But this is also where all of the misconceptions are. Because the air that's being recycled, the reason that it's being recycled is to take a little bit of strain off the packs. 
okay so it's to be able to use less of the bleed air in order to give you something to breathe the air is then being sucked out and it's going through a, a filter called a HEPA filter which is high efficiency particle absorbing filters these filters are made to absorb um, anything that's in the air that's bigger than 0 0.3 micrometers and they are efficient up to about 99.95 percent all right so they're extremely efficient filters. These filters are very similar to what you will find in, for example, hospitals. So the air inside of the cabin is actually as clean as the air as you'll find in a hospital environment. But of course, they are really, really careful because there's a lot of sick people in there. And another reason why you don't need to freak out about the air inside of the cabin is because it's also being replenished at a very high rate. So generally speaking, the air is being completely renewed inside of the cabin about 20 to 30 times per hour. So every two to three minutes, you will be breathing completely fresh air. And that's much more both filtered and freshness than you would get in almost any other place. You are more likely to contract a virus because of the air quality in your office building or in a train station or when you, well, maybe not when you're walking outside, but anytime that you're in a confined space, the air quality in the aircraft are actually very high. So I, I just want to really emphasize that. Now, some of you will say, well, I always feel like I'm getting a cold when I'm getting onto an aircraft or it's, I always sneeze more than I would normally. And that has to do with another thing. Remember how I told you that the air that was taken out of the engines are being going through an air cycle machine and the water vapor is being taken out? Well, that process, together with the fact that there's very little water vapor to start with when you're up at cruise altitude, makes the air in the cabin extremely dry. So if you have a bit of a cold, it's likely that the dryness of the air is going to make it tickle more in your throat, in your sinuses and in your nose than it would be at sea level with normal kind of um, moist air. But actually that has a positive point to it because the dry air is actually not conducive to spreading viruses. The drier the air, the less risk of spreading viruses. So the dryness of the air, even though it might feel very uncomfortable, is actually better, so you're safer, okay? Now, if a person sneezes, um, the, the, the water particles will move about six to eight feet. So that means that anyone that's in the, the, you know, the two, two rows surrounding the person who sneezes are at risk of breathing that in. Of course, the air cycling through the HEPA filters cannot stop direct impact from, um, from the, you know, the, uh, the water particles. So people are asking, should we be wearing face masks? And the answer to that is, yeah, face masks can be a good way to, uh, to stop the virus from spreading to you. Um, but a far bigger a more important thing to do is to keep a good hand hygiene, right? It is to have some uh, some alcohol gel, you know, some of that that um, cleaning gel for your hands with you if you don't have access to running water. And if you do have access to running water, make sure that you clean your hands properly with soap for up to 20 seconds before you eat, for example, or put your hands in your mouth for whatever reason. So good hand hygiene use one of those masks if you want to but the reason that those masks tend not to be so effective is that people tend to put their hands inside of the masks to to scratch themselves or whatever and whenever you do that you're still taking a potential virus in towards your mouth or if you are infected with it you're actually spreading it onto surfaces that you touch so um I know a lot of people take with them little uh, kind of wet wipes to wipe the area where they're sitting that could also be a good idea um, but generally, if there's one thing that you should be doing is cleaning your hands, right? Keep your hands clean. So what would happen if you are traveling from a region that there is a known case of the outbreak? So let's say that you're flying from Wuhan and into um, to another place. What if the flight crew or the cabin crew notices that someone has the symptoms on board? Well, this is quite fascinating. So the cabin crew have ways of dealing with sick passengers. Normally, there's only one cabin crew that will be dealing with sick passengers so that not everyone is, is involved. They can be using gloves, they can be using face masks. And this is something that we've seen throughout the world now. Different airlines are tackling this differently. Um, 
some crew would be using uh, masks all the time now because of the increased risk. Um, but they will be finding out what's wrong with this person. So asking them about their age, their symptoms, if they've had any previous problems, where they've been, things like that. And they will be passing that information on to the flight crew. We will be writing down that and then we will be contacting a, a person on the ground. If the, per, if the passenger needs, for example, medical attention or an ambulance, we will be telling them about that. But also we'll be passing on the symptoms. And the reason for that is because the people on the, on the ground, which is the, um, the Center for Disease Control in the US or Port Health, it's called, if you fly into the UK, for example, they will be assessing where is this aircraft coming from and is there anything that we need to watch out for? And if I've been flying out of Wuhan and I'm coming in and I'm reporting that there's a passenger on board who's showing signs of the flu with high fever, for example, well, then it's likely that this aircraft is going to be quarantined. You're seeing reports of that happening even to cruise ships uh, nowadays. But I have actually myself been in a situation where I have been quarantined. And that happened back in 2003 when the SARS epidemic was on. Me and my captain, I was the first officer at the point, was flying from a, uh, from a destination. I can't remember which one it was in southern France. And then we were flying back to London. During the flight, our cabin crew came in and said that we have a passenger on board who is vomiting and she's showing signs of the flu. Now, we didn't connect the dots then. We didn't think about it. So we just contacted Port Health. The passenger had asked to get some medical attention when we got down. We contacted Port Health, said, listen, we have a passenger on board. She's showing signs of the flu. Can you ask for a doctor when we arrive? But we didn't even tell air traffic control that we had a medical emergency because it wasn't a medical emergency. But anyway, after we did that, suddenly we started getting these really good directs, as in direct routings that you never get. Normally you fly a very long arrival route into London. In this case, we just got a direct towards a 10 miles final into runway um, 23 in, in Stansted. Didn't think much of it. We ta talked a little bit about maybe they misunderstood, maybe they've been told that there's a medical emergency on board, but we, we didn't understand. So. We flew, came in, landed, and after we landed, we were flanked up by two fire trucks, one on each side of the aircraft. And this is where we started to kind of connect in the dots, thinking, that, ah, it's the SARS epidemic. The SARS epidemic had very similar kind of news coverage as what you're seeing around the coronavirus today. We were taken to a remote stand, and we were told that the aircraft is under quarantine, do not let the passengers disembark, and we were allowed to open the forward door, and in came a... Um, uh, a medical professional that went down to the um, to the passenger, interviewed her. So that medical person very quickly uh, established the fact that the passenger actually had a cold, but she had also eaten some seafood and she thought that that might have been bad seafood that was, was causing the vomiting. So they could quickly uh, rule out SARS as being the reason. And we only had uh, a ground delay of about an hour before we could disembark all of the passengers and get on our way. But it goes to show to what length the uh, authorities are willing to go to make sure that, uh, that they're not, you know, that passengers and crew and cargo are not being transmitted into a, a country and potentially spreading the disease. So what are the airlines doing then? Well, um, the airline industry is going to be heavily affected by this. We have seen this happening pre before, so back in 2003 with the SARS epidemic. Um, there was a huge financial impact to the airlines, especially to airlines flying into the affected countries, so Asia and in general and China in particular. Uh, but it tends to be a very overgoing, like it, 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 it has an effect for a few months and then it kind of resides. What the airlines are doing to, to kind of protect their crew is that they can allow the cabin crew to wear face masks, in some cases even hazmat suits, if you've seen those huge suits. Uh, that would be primarily when they're evacuating passengers out of the affected countries. Um, but we can also disinfect the aircraft. So on a regular basis, a, uh, um, an airline will disinfect the aircraft maybe once a month or even less than that. That is a procedure that we're doing when there's no passengers on board and they're going around spraying a special aerosol that is there to kill, not kill viruses because killing viruses is very hard, but it's, it's spraying something that will infect the DNA of the viruses, effectively stopping them from being able to reproduce and spread. So that's being done and while on a normal you know, 
normal operational schedule that would happen like i said maybe once a month or even less than that if they are operating in and out of, of countries or destinations that have a known uh, occurrence of this disease it can be done after each flight okay so uh, i've seen videos about some airlines showing on twitter that they're doing this in order to calm passengers down now the disinfection is different than disinsection I know that if you've been flying into Thailand, for example, or flying from one tropical destination to another, you might have seen the cabin crew walking through the cabin with these aerosols, spraying it out into the air. Now, what they're doing is they're spraying something that kills bugs, primarily mosquitoes. And that's to avoid mosquitoes carrying things like the Zika virus or malaria to spread from one tropical region to another. So that's what you're seeing and that's perfectly okay to be in the cabin as they're spraying that. It's to kill mosquitoes. Right. Viruses, similar outbreaks. So what I would like you to do is please follow the World, the World Health Organization guidance on this. I'm going to link to it down here. I also want you to just think of things like, you know, washing your hands properly by all means wear a face mask if you're going out into public places things like that but do not panic all right just follow the guidance that your government is sending out to you and i think that we're going to come out on the other side of this just fine before i go i want to say again a huge thank you to my patreon crew Right, you guys are absolutely awesome. The way that you preview my videos, come with feedback on videos, working as a kind of a, uh, a foolproofing system to make sure I don't say something stupid and helping me with thumbnails. Everything is greatly appreciated. And of course, the, uh, the financial security that you're providing with me and my family and my company is greatly, greatly appreciated. So if you're sitting out there now thinking, I like the kind of content that this dude is doing, well then check out my Patreon crew. There's a link down here where you can go and you can donate as little or as much as you want, but it's all very, very appreciated. And like I said, if you go for the $10 per month or above, I will also give you the premium membership inside of the Mentor Aviation app so that you can ask questions during live streams and things like that. So without further ado, have an absolutely fantastic day and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Right guys, I really hope that you liked that. If you want more content like that, more aviation content, well then check this out. Uh, I hope that you have subscribed to the channel and that you've highlighted the little notification bell. See you inside of the Mentor Aviation app and have an absolutely fantastic day. Bye-bye.